prepare. Our hearts are ready. We've been with expectation. I'm not. There I am. There I'm on. Yeah, that sounds better. I can hear me. Maybe that's not so good. But anyway, good to be here again. And I had a tremendous time last time I was here. And uh, God's just did some great things. And uh, anyway, pastor invited me to come. I've got a couple of days in between some meetings. And so I came from meetings. I'm on my way to meetings. And so anyway, but this, my wife's going to meet me at the next meeting. So I will get to see her. And uh, that's good. And again, good to be here with you tonight with pastor. And uh Again, to see you. Um, I just want to mention some things are on my table back there. I'll be back there helping you with the table. And uh, oh, she's, who's, you're going to help me. Good. Okay. Then I'll show you what to do. Okay. As soon as church is over. And so, anyways, I've got a book back there called Life and Power. This is the two major ministries of the Holy Spirit. That every other ministry of the Holy Spirit comes from one of those two. And uh, this is my latest book. But anyway, on this one, uh, Life. That's the, the Holy Spirit's work in the new birth. And then on power, it's the Holy Spirit's infilling that gives you power in the Christian life. And every other ministry, such as guidance and all these other things, power for all the things that you do in life, again, they come from these ministries. So that's back there on the table. And the book is $10, but it's also available on flash drive and on CD and on DVD. And so uh, for any of those three, if you buy one of those, the book is free. And especially the flash drive, the flash drive is both audio and video. And, of course, he gets into more detail than the book does. So, But the book is great. You'll enjoy it. And uh, then there's one on guidance. In fact, this is a, a flash drive on guidance. And to me, one of the major things that we have as Christians is the guidance of the Holy Spirit. There's been times, just general guidance. General guidance comes from the Word of God. The Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you into all truth. And he will show you things, things to come. He guides you from the Word, and then he guides you outside the Word. And the, that guidance outside the Word of God is specific things just for your life. From the Word of God is guidance for everybody. But I had a man in my church tell me one time, he said, I prayed for guidance, all I got was Scripture. I thought, well, that's the way it's supposed to happen. 95% of your guidance will be Scripture. I've had Christians tell me, well, the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to me. I said, you ever get up during the day and think of a Scripture that applies to your situation? Well, yeah. I said, that's the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Well, that could be just me. I said, did the Scripture... Was it in line with what you were what you were asking for or was what needing? Yeah, and I said, what's the odds that you would think of one scripture out of 7,000 promises in the Bible that lined up with your situation? You're not that smart. It's the Holy Spirit is that smart, and he gives you a scripture. But we often just think, well, that's just, that's just the Holy Spirit showing you a scripture. That's the major way he guides you is through scripture. But then there's other 5% of the time when I can look back on my life where he's actually showed me specific things to do. Specifically, I would pastor the church. Specifically, I would be a teacher at Rhema. Specifically, he even told me when I'd be stepping down from the church and turning over to my son. All this stuff, it doesn't happen that often, but the rest of the time is just general guidance and there's specific guidance. So that's what this talks about. And then instances from the Word of God on that. And one of the greatest ways that you can get guidance in your life for specific things is by praying in the Holy Spirit. Paul said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. And he was referring to a church that, re that prayed in tongues a lot. But that's the times when, again, it wasn't just, you know, there's times you can make up your own mind. I mean, there's times people say, well, how do you know that was the Holy Spirit? It's that I have peace inside. That's one of the greatest ways to have guidance is the peace of God in the situation. And so I just check my heart. If there's peace, then I do it. And so, again, that's back there on that series on guidance. That would be a great blessing. And then I've got a book back there on Hebrews. And, of course, this is the book of Hebrews. But just teaching Hebrews and, and, and uh, Galatians go hand in hand. One was written to Gentiles, that's Galatians, and one was written to Jews, this is Hebrews. But both of them dealing with the same thing, the fact that we are no longer under the law, Jesus fulfilled every bit of it. When he said on the cross, it is finished, he literally meant it was finished. The Old Testament was over. Now we can still benefit from the Old Testament, learn from it, but aren't you glad we're not under the law? Amen. Aren't you glad you didn't have to drag heifers in here tonight to church? I'm glad I didn't have to kill them. Okay, I'm glad those days are over. And all the things that they had to do back there, all the washings and all of the uh, things they had, all those things pointed to Jesus Christ. And when he came, the reality came, those things were over. And so that's the essence of the book of Hebrews. And, of course, those will be a great blessing for you. And, again, thank you for inviting me. It's good to be here. And the weather's here nice. Or here it is in Oklahoma. It's hot in Oklahoma. So it's nice to have a little cool weather. Of course, in the middle of the winter, I'll be glad I'm in Oklahoma. So, anyway, turn to Romans chapter 12 tonight. 
you know, every one of us had differences in doctrines. You know, it's amazing. You know, I don't know how many churches there are around here. In Oklahoma, we have like two and three on a corner. And uh, one will be a Baptist church and a Methodist church, and down the street will be an Assembly of God and a Charismatic and a Word church, and all the different churches we have. And it's amazing how you can be on a street corner and never even know the pastor across the street. And I have to admit, when I pastored all those years, there was churches around me. I never just went and met them. One time I did, there was a Church of Christ around the corner from us, so I went there and met the pastor, and he wasn't real friendly with me. I just went to say hi. I said, I'm around the corner, and I've been there for years, and I know your church is here, and I said, I want to tell you what a beautiful building you have. I drive by it every day, but I thought I'd just stop by him and say hi to you. Well, he just acted like, you know, well, thank you, but goodbye. And that's often the way pastors are with each other. That's often the way we are with denominational people. You don't believe like we do. You'll meet a Baptist or you'll meet a Methodist. The first thing that comes up in your mind is we don't agree on a certain subject. And uh, I remember one time I was teaching on a Wednesday night. And uh, we must have had 300 people. And I would always say Wednesday night to teach verse by verse through a book. And I'd teach sometimes through an Old Testament book, sometimes through a New Testament book. And I'd take a number of weeks and do that. And I came out of the book of Philippians. I was in the book of Philippians. And I came to chapter 3 and verse 15. And Galatians 3.15, oh, pardon, Philippians 3.15 says this, If in anything you be otherwise minded, God will reveal it to you. And what the verse was saying was, quit quibbling over things we disagree on. Do you know we agree on more than we disagree on? But why is it when we see somebody in the church, the first thing that flashes in our mind is they don't believe this. And they don't believe this. And that's what happens with ministers, sadly. And so, again, it says, if in anything you be otherwise minded, God will reveal it to you. So I said, and what this verse is saying, I told everybody there, I said, we all have differences of opinion on certain things. The sad thing is we not only disagree with Methodists down the street, we disagree with each other. And you don't know it until they bring it up one day. You go, I didn't know you believed that. That lady leave the church over that one time. I was teaching on marriage, and I don't even remember exactly what I said. And she came up and looked at me and said, I didn't know you believed that. If I had known that, I'd have never joined this church. And she stalked off and walked off. And I mean, I, didn't, I couldn't catch her fast enough. I asked somebody, you know what her name is? And one person remembered her name. So I went and looked her up and wrote her a note. And I just said it to her. This was before emails. So you can see how old I really am. I just sent her a nice card. And all it said on the inside was, I'm so sorry that you disagree with me on this subject and all that. And I said, I said, I thought maybe God led you to this church. But please, would you do me a favor? The next church you go to, make sure God leads you there because you will find out from that church there's something you disagree on. And you need to know that God put you there so that you'll know it's all right to disagree on a subject. And I said, if, you know, you came to this church and we disagreed on a subject, I said, but the next church, make sure that it's right. Because if you don't, then you'll go to another church and find out they disagree. You'll go to another church and they disagree. And all I said was, I was hoping that you had come to this church because God led you here. And you know what? Three weeks later, she was back in church. She said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I said that and acted like that. She said, I just want you to know God did lead me here. And she said, I didn't know you taught that, didn't know you thought of that. But she said, I was led here by the Holy Spirit. I walked in church one day, just knew this was where I'm supposed to be. I let my feelings stand away. She said, I'm back and please forgive me. And I said, I do. And she said, I still disagree with you on that subject. I said, okay, that's fine. I said, how about we just wait till we get to heaven and either God will tell you Bob was right or I'll find out you were right. But in the meantime, we get along with each other even though we disagree. And so anyway, on that Wednesday night, I was teaching that, and I said, uh, you know, how many have ever heard me teach on something you disagree on? And you know what? Every hand went up. I thought, what's wrong? I thought maybe 20 hands would go up, but not all 300 hands would go up. And when I said that, I said, what is it that you disagree with? And all the women yelled out, you said our pets don't go to heaven. See, the women are already getting mad at me. The hair is standing up on the back of their head. And anyway, and, and I said, you know, and, and, they, and I, I remember when I taught that, because after I taught that, I must have got 50 copies, CD or DVD copies of All Dogs Go to Heaven. <laughs> and they were trying to tell me, you know, that, you know, my pet's going to be there. I said, that's all right. If you get there and your pets are there, please come and tell Pastor Bob he was wrong. I just don't believe Jesus died for your dogs and cats. Okay? And anyway, so uh, we, we all laughed about that. But the point of it is, is the New Testament was filled with that, too. People that disagreed with each other. And here's the point. You know what? If Pastor and I disagree on, I don't know why if we would or not, but let's just say there's something we disagree on, and we even got upset with each other over it. We split our ways because of, did you know, if we both died at the same time and walked up to heaven, Jesus would put his arms around both of us? 
Because he didn't save us so we'd all agree on every subject. The Bible doesn't say we're to strive for the unity of, of the faith. It said we're just to strive for the unity of the spirit. See, the unity of faith means we all believe the same thing. I remember, I remember a pastor saying one time, the world's not, well, Jesus won't come back until we agree on everything. I thought, he's never coming back. We might as well forget that, you know, because he's never going to come back. Every, you get two or three Christians together, you'll find out we disagree on something. But the point of it is, maturity is when you can still fellowship with somebody, though you disagree on a subject. And I have been placed in the middle of a situation right now because I, I, I don't have, you know, Andrew Wallach's a friend, and a lot of pastors have come there and stuff with friends. And it's kind of a different group of people because I came out of a faith camp. I was raised on grace. But then I worked for Kenneth Hagin. I came out of a faith background with Brother Hagin, learned the message of faith. And not much was being said about grace, although I believed in grace. And I would talk to people about it. I was so happy when I met Andrew and we, and we started talking about that. Then we found out we disagreed on certain things. You know? And uh, so then he had other people come in that would teach on things. I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe they think that. I mean, they totally got, I thought they got scriptures out of context and all that. I wasn't sure I wanted to hang around that person. And one day the Lord got all over me and said, I died for him and he accepted me. She died, I mean, you know, he died for her and, and she accepted Jesus. And all these things, we're all going to have things we disagree on. But when you realize something is that it's not doctrine that unites a church. Doctrines unite denominational churches, in fact, they're all formed around doctrine. In fact, a lot of denominational churches exist because they split off with somebody else over a disagreement. The four squares split off from the Assemblies of God years ago because they disagreed on church government. And so they named it four square. That's what they taught their church government on. I thought, what a, what a silly thing to separate on and start a church down the street over one thing about church government. The Bible doesn't even give laws on church government. It just gives, it gives guidelines. Um, here's how we should set up and all that, but nothing specific because no two churches are the same, no two pastors are the same. And so getting along with each other is the most important thing and God wants us. In fact, one thing is stressed throughout the New Testament continually is unity, unity, unity. But you cannot have unity over doctrine because we're all going to disagree on something. Unity comes from coming around a vision together. Vision is what unites a church. And the vision should be twofold. Number one, we want to make we want to make Christians out of sinners. And number two, we want to make disciples out of those Christians. And that's the Great Commission. That's what we unite around. And so I, I think that part of the Great Commission is to get people to pray in tongues and speak in tongues because that's where their power comes from, to stand against Satan. But if you don't, that's quite all right. You're just as saved as I am. But I believe that the baptism of the Spirit, infilling of the Spirit, is necessary for life. And the reason why is it makes earth a little more like heaven till I get there. And so this is why I believe that. But again, we're going to talk about that tonight. And look what Paul said here in Romans chapter 12. And I want to take a look at verses 4 and 5. As we have many members in one body, but all members have not the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. This was Paul's message. In fact, interestingly, Paul mentioned this. We're going to talk about this. Is that Paul mentioned the body and the head in different books that he had. In fact, the emphasis of the book of Ephesians is the body of Christ. The emphasis of Colossians is the head of the church, Jesus Christ. And it talks there about the unity between the head and the body, and then also here in this verse, the unity of the members of the body of Christ. I know you know this, but the moment you became born again, you became a member of the body of Christ. You didn't ask him where to put you. You had no choice in this because God places us in the body as it pleases him. And then the gifts of the Spirit are given by the will of the Holy Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he wills. There's certain things in the Christian life we have no control over. One of them is found in Acts chapter 17 that says, God has set the times and the boundaries of our habitation. You had no choice as to what time period you were born in. You had no choice as to what country you were born in. You had no choice as to which city in the country, which side of the city, which socioeconomic economic border that you are on one side or the other. You had no choice to be a man or a woman. You had no choice of your nationality. You had no choice of your color. All the different things that we divide over are things we didn't have a choice in. Why should you separate from me because you're a different color than I am? Did you ask to be that color? I didn't ask to be this color. Did you ask to be a certain, you know, certain, did you choose your parents? 
The answer is no, God did all that. In other words, if God chose the time period you're going to be born in, the city you would be born in, which side of the tracks you're going to be born on, which gender you would be, and all these things that we have, what color, nationality, all these other things, then apparently he has a plan for our life despite all these things that people yell and scream about today. In other words, God chose the times and seasons in the times of your life because what he's simply saying is you were chosen for such a time as this. And you are who you are. And God has simply set up that the, all these things that we separate from each other is because what we see is we separate from Christians sometimes, but you know what? The world isolates themselves. So we see it in society all around us. This one's going to empower themselves, and this one's going to empower themselves, when the whole point of this power comes from God. Let's just accept what he has for our life and find out what his will is and what his covenant with us is and the call that he's placed on our life. Here in this verse of scripture, what Paul is simply saying is we need to strive for unity in the body of Christ. So unity in the body and with the head was very important to Paul. Listen to me carefully. Paul is the only writer of the New Testament that wrote on the body and the head. No one else. In fact, it was so important to him, he wrote on it nine different times. Nine times Paul mentioned the head or the body or unity between the head and the body or unity among the members of the body of Christ. We have it here in Romans chapter 12. We have it also in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We have it in Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5. These are not extensions of each other. These are separate time periods that Paul spoke on either Jesus is the head, we are the body, we need to be unified with him, and we need to be unified with each other. And also Colossians chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to say this again. No other writer even wrote on the head being Christ or us being members of the body except for Paul. And it was so important to Paul, again, he mentioned it nine different times, and the Holy Spirit gave him permission to do so. So here we have it. And so, again, no other writer mentions it as the head of the body. And to understand this, we have to go back to how Saul became Paul. So turn with me to the book of Acts, if you would, chapter 7. And we're going to trace out how Paul became, the, or Saul became the apostle Paul, how his conversion took place, and what was it that was so important to him that he mentioned it where no other writer did. Listen, we'll quote this in just a moment. John mentioned the unity that we have with each other and with Jesus, but he mentioned it only because Jesus prayed it and he quoted Jesus' prayer. Even John, who was the apostle of love, the apostle of love one toward each other, never mentioned the body of Christ or Jesus being the head, only Paul. And so here in Acts chapter 7, I want to start with verse 58, and I want to go through chapter 8 and verse 4. And here it says in Acts 7, 58, they, that is the Jewish leaders, cast him, that is Stephen, out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen, who called on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not lay this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, that is Stephen's death, great persecution arose against the church at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. What this is saying is, is that Stephen's death sparked something in the Jews to start killing more Christians. Great persecution started when this man who was able to preach in front of them, this man who was not even a five-fold minister, he was not a pastor or an apostle, he was a deacon in the church, stood there and defied the religious leaders of Jerusalem publicly and humiliated them in front of an entire crowd. When they kept trying to stand up that Jesus was not the Messiah, he traced the entire Old Testament and taught Jesus throughout the Old Testament. And then finally came down to this, you took the Messiah and crucified him. The one that you've been saying you've been waiting on all these years. And they finally got so angry at him, they put their fingers in their ears and ran at him screaming. They couldn't take what he was saying and finally picked up rocks and killed him. And the moment they killed him, just before he died, he said, I see Jesus standing through right here. Oh, that really irritated them. They couldn't take that. 
And so, again, they just screamed and yelled because it says here he exposed the things of their heart. And so it goes on to say, in, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. But Saul made havoc of the church, entering every house. I want you to underline that if you can, every house. The Bible doesn't stick words in there for no reason. Saul and his men went to every house in Jerusalem looking for Christians. And when they found them, they dragged them away and put them in prison and killed them. And he goes on to say there, dragging off men and women and committing them to prison, then those who were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word of God. The Jewish leaders were confused by this Christian movement. Never had they seen a movement grow without the leader. The leader was already, they thought he was killed on the cross. They didn't think he was actually risen from the dead. So they just, they just refuted that. But we know the story. He was risen. He did raise from the dead. And he was on the earth for 40 days and then ascended into heaven. We know the story. But they refused to believe that. And so what they couldn't understand was how this thing kept growing. There had been other leaders before who had come along with small groups of people, fanatical groups of people. But as soon as the leader was killed, the whole thing just disbanded. Not with Christianity. In fact, the harder they were persecuted, the more they spread out everywhere and kept preaching the gospel. Nothing stopped them from preaching the gospel. Next of all, most of these people were not even religious. These are not Jews who became Christians. Some were, but not the most of them were just masses off the street who never attended the synagogue. And the danger of this group of people was this. They taught that you're not saved by the keeping of the law and you didn't need to come to the temple to, uh, for feast days or to sacrifice. None of that was necessary. They taught that all this was fulfilled by Jesus, and next of all, they taught Jesus was the Messiah, and to make matters worse, they had the same power Jesus did. They could see the sick healed and the dead raised. They had this mighty power to do great things. In fact, Jesus said, the things I do, you'll do also in greater things. We have it later on here that Peter walked down the street and his shadow started healing people. Jesus never had that. He said they would do greater works. And that's not even greater works just because they're, they're more magnificent than what Jesus did or unique from what Jesus did. It also means there's a whole lot more because instead of one Jesus going around, there were thousands going around operating in the same miracle power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they didn't know what to do with it. They became so angry and they started killing Christians and Saul went from door to door that they finally hired Saul. They saw such a fanatic in Saul. They hired him. They said, go to any town you want to. And so Saul later will come to them and ask for papers. And we're going to find out that he was headed toward Damascus at the time to find Christians and kill them. So again, they claim Jesus is the Messiah. And so Saul was so fervently dedicated to the Jewish religion. Look with me at Galatians chapter 1. Keep your finger there and ask for coming back. But in Galatians chapter 1, notice how Paul referred back to when he was Saul. In Galatians 1.14, it says this. I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. What a great description of religion. Traditions. He said, I was zealous for the traditions. I, I, I attended college, and one of the men down the hall, we started talking because, again, I came out of, out of a Pentecostal church, and, and ours was an independent church. We weren't attached to a denomination. And so I started talking to the young man down the hall, and his father was a elder in the Presbyterian church. And I started asking how the church was run and all that. But he started telling me things. I said, where's that in the Bible? He said, it's not in the Bible. That's traditions. And he'd go on and say something else. I said, oh, where's that in the Bible? He says, it's not in the Bible. That's traditions. And what I found out, he told me was, he said, Whenever our church board makes these decisions, it comes to the same level as the Bible. And I thought, whoa, that's pretty bold. Isn't it? That sounds like a Catholic church, doesn't it? Yeah. Whatever they make, it's, it's, it's the Bible plus the Catholic. And who cares if they contradict each other? You know, times have changed, and so we can rightfully change things. And that's what he said. This is what happened. Saul said, or Paul, as Saul said this, I was so zealous for the traditions of my fathers. In other words, they had lost their meaning. They just did it because they were supposed to. How sad it is when Christian or Christian things lose their meaning. How sad to partake of communion is just another week to do it. How sad it is to see people be water baptized and think we're just putting a person down and pulling them up wet. That is not what it means. Those things mean something. 
And so Saul said, all these things had lost their meaning. I just did it because I was exceedingly zealous for the traditions. And I was so legalistic that what he thought was God was rewarding me for doing this and even killing Christians. That I was going to get a great reward. He thought God was patting him on the back for the wonderful job he was doing, killing Christians. So look with me back at Acts chapter 9. The rest of Acts chapter 8 is the revival at Samaria with Philip. And in chapter 9, verse 1, we now go back and take up where we left off with Saul. In Acts chapter 9, verse 1, Saul still, this means after Stephen, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters of him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he traveled, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shined round about him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. What he was saying was, when in your King James it says against the pricks, that was what exactly what a goad was. It had a long thorn on the end of it. And whenever an oxen was pulling and it just suddenly stopped and wouldn't go, they would jab him with that and would goad him and he would go. And God said, I have been goading you for a long time, but you keep ignoring what I'm doing. Nothing could be worse than goad an animal than he kicks you. That's what God's saying is basically I goad you and you kick me. I'm trying to catch your attention, but the only way I can catch your attention is this. I had to knock you down to the ground and a sh light shining around about you to catch your attention. And I want you to notice what he said to him again. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And you know what? Saul recognized this voice. And the way the voice talked to him, only he called him Jehovah. He'd always called him Jehovah. This was the Old Testament title. But what he didn't know was that Jehovah was Jesus. He'd always appeared in the Old Testament. He's always been the manifested member of the Godhead. When God spoke, he spoke through Jehovah. When God appeared, he appeared through Jehovah. When God led somebody, he appeared, he came through Jehovah. Jehovah has always been the second member of the Godhead and the one who comes to do the will of God. God the Father creates the plan. Jesus Christ executes the plan and the Holy Spirit reveals it. Always, Jesus Christ has been the one who did the work. God planned salvation. Jesus went to the cross and accomplished it and the Holy Spirit revealed it. In creation, God spoke it. Jesus did it. We're told in the New Testament, by him were all things created, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so then the Holy Spirit revealed it. It's always been that way, and here he is thinking this is Jehovah, and all of a sudden Jehovah says, I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. Who are you? I'm Jesus. When he said, why are you persecuting me? The first thing that Saul must have thought was, why am I persecuting you? I'm helping you. I'm on your side. We're stopping all these fanatics over here. Now you're telling me I'm persecuting you? And then he finds out his name is Jesus. He said, well, listen. He said, I just killed a young man. We stoned a young man that was part of the church. No, you stoned me. But his name was Stephen. No, his name was Jesus. Whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you do to me. And it suddenly struck Saul. No wonder these people stick together. No wonder they keep going. They're attached to Jesus. Jesus is attached to them, and there never was a break. Even though he ascended into heaven, we're more unified than we've ever been before. You understand what I'm saying? We are members of the body of Christ. And from the very point when he was saved, the first thing he sees is unity. And that stuck with him. That's why he brings that nine different times. The point that brought him around was, I'm trying to kill these guys. And on top of that, Jesus is still attached to them. Anytime we've killed a leader before, it's separated from the group. And they all broke up. The power that Jesus had, he still has, but he has given to these people. His name is still there. They stand in his name. They call their church church, which is the unity they have because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is the foundation of the church and we're all built on him. He's a stone, we're a stone. He's a foundation stone, we're living stones attached to him. His power is infused in us. In fact, he gave us the same Holy Spirit he had. 
And so when I go, don't you budge until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you to accomplish my will, to preach in my name. And all of a sudden, they begin to go out and preach in the name of Jesus. Jesus' will was now being done through the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, the first revelation Saul had when he became Paul on the road to Damascus is Jesus is one with all Christians. Let me tell you how fanatic he was. Can anybody tell me where Damascus is? Syria. He was actually going to Gentile countries to find Christians. Syria is so far out of the way. But this guy was so fanatical. And God stopped him on the way to Syria, to Damascus. And so all of a sudden, after Saul received the Lord, he wasn't seen for 14 years in Jerusalem. He said that in the book of Galatians. I was unknown by face for 14 years in Jerusalem and Judea. Only they heard what had happened to him. Rumors went everywhere, probably, because of Ananias who came and helped him and, and laid hands on him and his sight came back and Ananias probably went back and told people. But again, this reputation was everywhere. And 14 years later, he finally showed up after receiving the great revelations that he wrote later on in Romans and Galatians and Ephesians, of which, again, the major one through there is unity, unity, unity. He understood the unity he had with the Father, but he also understood the unity we have with each other. What I'm trying to let you know is this. Why should we separate from each other? I don't believe that the, that the body of Christ has a Baptist ear and a Methodist nose. I don't think it has Baptist hands. I don't think we're divided. I think we're unified. We divide ourselves, but God never sees us as divided. You know what? You say, yeah, but what if we do have a Methodist ear, we do have a, a Baptist nose? We can't. We call it the Baptist. God calls it the nose. We call it the Methodist. God calls it the ear. That's all God sees is the different parts of the body of Christ. We come and divide it. There's not going to be a section in heaven for Methodists. And there's not going to be a Assembly of God section of heaven. We're just all going to stand around the throne of God and praise Him forever and forever and laugh at the denominations we had down here, how we purposely separated ourselves over doctrines that were not heaven or hell issues. I don't know where you stand on the rapture. I know what I believe. But you know what? If you disagree with me, that's fine. I'm thoroughly willing to wait till we're all flying through the air to say, see, I told you so. But if I'm wrong, then you tell me I was wrong. You know what? I believe these things, but you know what? There was a time when I, I used to look forward to times when I could mention something that I disagreed with people on. And God, when I got this message, God began to get all over me. And that's basically this. Yeah, you will disagree, but you know what? Disagree behind the scenes where we can discuss it. But once we walk out of that room, we have our arms around each other. We're called to win souls and make disciples of all nations. That's the call that we have. And of course here we have it again. Look with me at John chapter 17. Let's take a look at the prayer that Jesus prayed that John wrote. Again, John wrote this, but it wasn't really him, his theology. He was writing what Jesus prayed in the garden. John 17 verse 21. That they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you that they also may be one in us, and the glory you have given me, I have given them. That they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me. This verse is simply saying what the Lord said is we are one, we need to act like one. Lord, I know that you have made us one. Help them realize that we are one and begin to act like one. The way that you act like one as a church and as Christians is when you realize God has made you one. No one in here is superior to another. I know you have your pastor, but he's not superior to you. I know I'm coming here as a minister, as a teacher of the word of God, but you know what? I'm not superior to any of you. And Jesus will never stand up and tell you he's superior to us. He's the head because that's where all the information flows, but he's also the head because he's not on earth. He's seated in heaven. He wasn't the head while he walked on the earth. He was there among everybody. And in fact, instead of exalting himself, he humbled himself. What kind of leader walks in and washes the feet of the, of the followers? Jesus did. Peter felt somebody said, stop it. Just stop it. And Jesus said, no. He said, if you truly want to be exalted, start at the bottom. How do you know if you start at the bottom, you can't go any lower? There's only one direction to go. That's up. Anybody flipping burgers at McDonald's knows there's no, the only place that's lower than this is being fired, okay? <laughs> so I'm as low as I can get, and there's nowhere for me to go but up. And he simply said that when you walk into a feast, don't ask for the nicest place, and can I sit over here? He said, well, what's going to happen is somebody else will come, and they'll ask you to move lower. 
walk in and take the lowest seat possible, then they'll tell you, don't come to this one, they'll begin to be exalted. He said, that's the way that exaltation comes in the body of Christ. And so Jesus showed us that. So again, what, what the prayer is, let's take a look at it again, verse 21, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, that they also may be one in us, and the glory you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me. You know what? You can't get any better than this. This verse is simply saying we are in Christ, and Christ is in God, so that means we are in God. I'm going to say that again. This verse is saying we are in Christ, but Christ is in God. So if he's in God and I'm in him, then I'm in God too. In other words, we are so wound up together, we are so mingled together, it's hard to tell where Bob stops and Jesus begins, where Jesus ends and God starts. We are all mingled together. Unity here is based on the covenant we have with him. In the Old Testament, when people drew up a covenant, they usually cut their hands. And they would let the blood either drop into a uh, cup of wine, and then they would drink it together, or, since God was against the drinking of blood, what the Lord did was he said they would mingle their blood with each other. When David and Jonathan became covenant brothers with each other, the word covenant means to cut. Abraham cut a covenant with God, and David cut a covenant with his best friend at that time, Jonathan. And when they reached out, after they cut their hands, and they reached over and shook hands with each other, that blood mingled together. That's what happened. We were purchased with the blood of Jesus, and his blood mingles with ours. What am I simply saying by that? It literally isn't the physical blood of Jesus. It's what the blood stands for. The life is in the blood. My life has been so mingled with Jesus. His life is so mingled with God the Father. God the Father's life is so mingled with me. I'm so mingled with you, and it comes back to this, how do you unmingle blood? I can't be unmingled from you. Don't get mad at me. Don't start yelling at me. Because you know why? We're mingled together. Oh, we might have our disagreements, but the point of it is we are one with each other. Let the major message be this. Despite the fact I disagree with you, we are one with each other. We have a job to do. And therefore, I believe, you know, if we understood that a little better, then we could understand that if there's a time we need to work together. I taught this a number of months ago. And the pastor said, you don't know how led by the Spirit you were. He said, next week, my people have been talking about it. They don't like this. But I called the Baptist preacher down the street and asked him to come and join us for a night and bring his people, and we were going to have a praise and worship. So it's something we could agree on totally. He said, my people said, we don't associate with them. They're Baptists. He said, they start talking. He said, and then one week before we're supposed to do this, I'm still getting right. You come and preach this sermon about Baptists. Did you know John Osteen and his church invited Baptist minister to come, to come in and preach? Because he came out of a Baptist background. And you know what he knew that we didn't know? There's some amazing preachers back there in the Baptist church. They're theologians. They open up the Bible different than we do. They don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, but he did it for two reasons. He wanted his people to hear the powerful sermons that came from a Baptist minister, but he also wanted the Baptist minister to experience a spirit-filled praise and worship service. And he said, he'd look at them during praise worship, and they're like, wow, what's going on here? Because you know what? You can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. Didn't happen with Psalm, or it didn't happen with hymn number 243 from their church. They just sang it, and it was just words, and the words are good. But to experience a song about the Lord, written about love to him, worship to him in the power of the Holy Spirit, he'd never experienced that. And so he wanted that to happen, but he opened up his door to them, and then they would open up the door to him, and he would go to their church and preach. So again, they have that type of unity. And you know what? That's the type of unity we need to have among each other. And oftentimes we walk into church and go, I don't want to sit near them because they believe this. I don't know where you stand on any, you know, on all these things, but you will find out eventually you might even disagree with the person sitting next to you, and that's your husband or wife on certain issues. No, she said, no, absolutely not. We, don't, we agree on everything. <laughs> it still comes back to this, we all will. And you know what? I believe this is why we'll be in heaven forever. He's got to straighten all of us out. So it comes back to this. We are in Christ. Christ is in God. So we are in God. When one member suffers or rejoices, we all suffer and rejoice because we are unified. At salvation, we join Christ 
He and we form the whole man. We are as inseparable from him as he is from the Father. We are as much one with him as he is one with the Father. Satan and the world will persecute us, but to persecute you is to persecute me. To persecute us is to persecute Christ. To persecute Christ is to persecute God, so we don't need to defend ourselves. God is the one who comes and promises he would take care of it. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You understand this, when somebody comes to pick on us, you know what it's like. You've seen those movies or you've seen in school. You start to pick on somebody and they call for their best friend to come over. And their best friend is about six foot four, weighs about 270 pounds. And all of a sudden the bully looks up and goes, oops. That's what happens with Satan. He comes to pick on us and forget something. We're united to Jesus Christ, our elder brother. And we're united to God, who's our father. And they're the ones who defends us. So when it comes to standing up for the gospel, we never have to defend ourselves when it comes to the gospel. I think it's all right to defend yourself if somebody just picks on you because you're pickable, okay? But the other point of it is, is that's all right in that case for self-defense, but not when it comes to the gospel. Never, ever do we have to, again, uh, defend ourselves when it comes to the case of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, vengeance is mine. By the cross we are inseparably joined by mingled blood. And again, how do you unmingle blood? I want to come back to something, too. All of this spreading of blood and, and spilling of blood and mingling of blood took place when Jesus went to the cross. I want to point out some things about the cross, about the crucifixion. In every one of the four Gospels, the crucifixion takes at least four chapters. All the things that happened from the time he was arrested till he went to the cross. Intricate detail. More detail is given to the beatings, the sufferings, the things that happened to Jesus, the whippings, the crown of thorns, the robe that was placed upon him, the clothes that were taken from him, the nailing to the cross, the carrying of his cross, even the man's name that helped him carry the cross, the man's name that offered his tomb for Jesus to be buried. More detail is given to Jesus and his crucifixion than any one miracle he did. There's many miracles and chapters on miracles, but it's this miracle followed by this one, followed by this healing. A little bit of description about each one, but no detail is given like there is with the crucifixion of Jesus. Would you buy a biography of somebody that in the book it might tell the things they did and the things that came to them and, and the things they set up in a business and the military things they did, but yet then it takes four chapters and describes intricately how this guy died? You think, what kind of book is this? Why is this being done? Why all this detail on the death of Jesus Christ? Why so much detail? And when Jesus went to the cross, all these things happened. He even told what time of day it was. Then about the third hour this happened, about the sixth hour this happened, and Jesus died just before the sun went down. That fulfilled an Old Testament prophecy, but it brings it out. Then he was taken off the cross, and he was in there for three days. All these things are told, and then how the stone was rolled away, all this... More detail is given on that than anything else. Why would that be? We're told that after he arose from the dead, the women were there. They saw him. All the things that happened to Jesus. But why so much detail about all the things that happened to Jesus? You might, in essence, say this, that the whole purpose of his life was to die. And that's kind of true. He came here to die. That's why so much detail was given. So although Jesus later rose from the dead, still more detail is given to his sufferings and his death and to his resurrection. All of that things is pro that's brought in back there. After resurrection, much is told of the 40 days where Jesus encouraged his disciples, encouraged two men on the road to Emmaus. He was seen by the women. He was seen by the disciples in small groups and large groups. After 40 days, he ascended in heaven to remain. Then he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Listen to me. Between the resurrection of Jesus and 40 days later his ascension, he never preached another sermon. He never performed a miracle. And he never healed anybody. All he did was appear to people and encourage them. And this is brought out in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 through 8, 
where he appeared to this one, appeared to that one, and encouraged them, and taught them some things, and showed them some things, but he never preached a sermon in front of the masses. In fact, the only thing he did in the front of the masses was, he said, that he appeared to small groups, then over 500 at one time. That was on the Mount of Olives before he went to heaven. A huge group of people around him. But he didn't preach a sermon, he just encouraged him. Why did Jesus not preach a sermon? Why? Because after the cross, he was finished. His ministry was finished. And for 40 days, he didn't do anything more about his ministry. And then he arose from the dead. Jesus didn't preach another sermon. Can anybody tell me what was the first sermon preached after Jesus rose from the dead? Peter at Pentecost. What was the first miracle of healing after Jesus rose from the dead? Peter and John at the gate beautiful in the next chapter, chapter 3 of the book of Acts. I'm simply saying between the resurrection and the ascension, Jesus did not continue his ministry. He remained here to encourage people and encourage them to go to the upper room and be filled with the Holy Spirit. What I'm telling you is the reason why Jesus went to the cross and nothing happened after that he was introducing the next act, which was the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, greater than he ever had been. Three years he was on this earth, and three days he went to the cross, and after he arose from the dead, we're 2,000 years into the church. The whole purpose of his death, burial, and resurrection was to introduce the best act coming after him, act two, and that is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Us. He came here not for himself. He came here to raise up something, and for 2,000 years... He's been seated at the right hand of the Father. Here's something interesting. When Jesus was on the earth, the disciples worked with him. After Jesus left the earth, he worked with the disciples. It says he went, and they went everywhere preaching the word, and Jesus worked with them, confirming the word, the signs following. So it simply comes back to then again, that's the purpose of the church. Jesus' death was an introduction to the main story Mark chapter 16, verses 19 and 20. After the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. Up until then, they worked with Jesus. Now he's working with them. And it says, confirming the word with signs following. But listen, not only members with Christ, we're members with each other. And what Jesus left behind, and Paul picked up the mantle of is, Walk together in unity. Walk together in love. He brings this out in the book of Philippians. He brings it out in Ephesians. There's chapters dedicated to unity among the members of the body of Christ. And he brings this out that until Jesus comes back again, we have the unity of the Spirit. We'll never have the unity of the doctrine until we get to heaven. Again, I, like I said, I heard a minister say that, you know, Jesus isn't coming back until we all agree on everything. I thought he's never coming back. In fact, we have a Baptist church over here, a Methodist church over here. We have to close all those things down and come together in one place. Now, that would be great, but that's called heaven. That's called the throne room of God. We will all fellowship around with each other. But in the meantime, he's telling us we need to strive for unity here on earth and quit separating from ourselves. Because you know what? Separation from each other causes us to ignore the Great Commission and go to work trying to straighten each one of us out. We're not going to be able to straighten each one of us out. You see, what unites this church, again, is not just doctrine. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit and the unity we have around the central call. And that is, again, why we are unified. So the members need to work together. Not only are we members with Christ, we're members with each other. If you're going blind, your nose cannot fill the place of the eye. If the heart is failing, the stomach cannot fill in and pump blood. Each part of our body plays a unique role as each of us do in the body of Christ. We are as much one with each other, and we are as much one with Jesus as Jesus is one with God the Father. If you're born again, you are a member of the body of Christ, one with the Father, one with Jesus, and one with all believers. Without Jesus in our life, we have no relationship or fellowship with God. Without Jesus in our life, we have no relationship or fellowship with Jesus. And without Jesus in our life, we have no relationship or fellowship with each other. God doesn't see us as Baptists, Methodists, or Pentecostals. He sees us as one in the body of Christ. Why can't we? 
When a radical Muslim beheads a Christian, he doesn't ask him first if he's a Baptist, Methodist, or a Catholic. He thinks we're all Christians. Why can't we? God doesn't see us as Baptists and Methodists. He sees us as nose, fingers, hands, all those things. Why can't we? It simply comes back to why can't we see the body of Christ like God does? And why can't we even see the body of Christ as sinners do? They just think we're all Christians. They don't know why we have a Baptist church on one corner, a Methodist church on the other. And we ought to be saying the same thing. Why do we? We don't need to. We're one in the body of Christ. Sadly, again, we not only separate ourselves from denominations, but we separate ourselves from each other, those of our own fellowship. That lady I told you about that left our church, she came back, but I cannot tell you how many other people got mad at me over something I preached and went somewhere else. Well, hang on, you find somebody else you're going to disagree with. If all you're looking for is things you disagree with, you can find them. And the Lord said, quit looking for things to disagree on. Find the things that you agree on. You know what Jesus agrees with us on? We became one with the body of Christ. How simple it was to put our faith in Jesus Christ, and that unifies us. Does God want us to have better understanding of the Word of God? The answer is yes. The more understanding you have of the Word of God, will you, will you have different beliefs than somebody else? Yes, you will. But that shouldn't stop you from the most important thing. We're inseparable. I can't be separated from God. He can't be separated from me. And I can't be separated from you. You cannot unmingle blood. And our lives have literally been mingled one with the other. Look at Mark chapter 9, if you would, in closing. There's only one who is not a part of the body of Christ. And that is the person who's rejected the work of Jesus on the cross. God doesn't see us separate from each other. He only makes one division. Us and the world. Period. That's it. What separates all mankind is not color. What separates all mankind is not nationality. What separates all mankind is not men or women. What separates all mankind is not young or old. I mean, we have all these conflicts going on today in the world. And sadly, we look at the world and say, look at all the divisions they have when the church has it too. There's only one division in all of mankind. There were two thieves next to Jesus on the cross. One said yes, and one said no. What separated the two was the guy in the middle. His name is Jesus what separates people on this earth, again, is not color, nationality, male, female, rich, poor, educated, uneducated. That's not what separates mankind. It's what do you think of Jesus Christ. That's what the difference between heaven and hell. You don't go to heaven because you were nice, and you don't go to hell because you were bad. You go to heaven because you accepted Jesus Christ. You go to hell because you rejected Jesus Christ. And that's the whole thing. And even as Christians, we often think, well, she was a nice woman, apparently she went to heaven. Listen, heaven is going to be filled with nice people and not nice people. And hell is going to be filled with nice people and not so nice people. The difference is, this group said yes to Jesus Christ, and this group said no. Those names not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. It simply comes back to that again. And look what it says here in Mark chapter 9. Look at verse 38 through 40. Now John answered him saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbid him because he does not follow us. Twice he said the reason why we told this guy to get off was because he didn't follow us. Look what Jesus told him. Jesus said, Don't forbid him, for no one can work a miracle in my name and soon afterwards speak evil of me. He who is not against us is on our side. He came down to one point. Is he against us or for us? Not that he agrees with us, not that he supports and follows our specific group. And you know what? I was raised in a Pentecostal denomination. I'm a Pentecostal church, not a denomination. I was raised in a Pentecostal church, and we looked at other Pentecostals who disagreed with us on whether you're saved always or not saved always, or whether or not you speak with tongues or don't speak with tongues. Or some taught that you can speak in tongues when you want to. Others taught that you can only speak in tongues when the Spirit of God comes on you and, and forces you almost to speak with tongues. I mean, there was all types of little things we disagreed on. And you know what? One guy believed in the rapture. Somebody else did not believe in the rapture. All these things we separated from each other on. And the most important thing was we all accepted Jesus as our Savior. 
Why don't we leave these other things up to God and one day straighten all of us out? And what John was saying, and this is, this is the apostle of love, John, who did understand unity, but what he said was, we stopped them because they don't follow us. They don't go to our church. They're not part of our group. And Jesus said, don't do that. And why do we do that? So it simply comes back again to this, and that is we are one in the body of Christ. So next time you're in Walmart, or you're in some store, and you find out the lady behind the cash register there is a Christian, and she starts to name the church that she goes to, say, well, good. Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Yes, then we are one in the body of Christ. Who cares what your natural title is? Who cares what people say about us? We are one in the body of Christ. All God's looking for is an ear that will do a good job, a nose that will do a good job, not necessarily what denominational background we are from. So I want you to do me a favor. I want you to find one person, look them right in the eye. I'm going to lead you with a confession. Look them in the eye, and I want you to say this. We may not agree on everything. Why don't you say it louder? We may not agree on everything, but we are both part of the body of Christ. We both have a mission to the world, and we are both going to heaven. I am connected to you, and you are connected to me. And we are both connected to Christ. And we need each other. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We need each other. You know what that means? I'm only here with you for a little while. But I can't come up here to Illinois and leave everybody to Jesus. That's your job. You know, the Bible says, yeah, but the Bible says go into all the world. You know what? It didn't say go you into all the world. It says go ye into all the world. There's not a command given to one person. It's a command given to everybody. You know what that means? You go into your part of the world. I'll go into my part of the world. And together we'll make sure the whole world is covered. Or there may be a specific calling you have to a certain country. But in the meantime, long before you go there, this is your world. Amen? This area, Marion, Illinois, is your world. And God simply says, go into that world and preach Jesus Christ and get people saved. That means you can't keep looking over the head of the woman behind the cash register at Walmart that doesn't know Jesus. I was at Walmart one day, and the lady behind that, she looked like she was just despondent. Usually Walmart people have a good smile on their face. They're taught to have that. And she didn't. And I said, is there something wrong? She said, yes, my daughter's really, really sick. I said, are you a Christian? She said, yes. I said, give me your hand. Right there, we stopped, and we agreed over that child to be healed in the name of Jesus. I never saw her after that, but I plan on seeing her in heaven. And for her to say, my daughter was healed that day. Thank you for the prayer of faith. You know, witnessing to people is not necessarily just talking about Jesus. It's showing Jesus, demonstrating. There's a world out there that's simply saying, we're tired of hearing a testimony. We want to see one. And how can they see it when all we do is look at them going, oh, you're a Baptist. Oh, you're a Methodist. No, they're a Christian. <laughs> one with Jesus and one with us. How important that is. Would you bow your heads for just a moment? Is there anyone here tonight that has never accepted Jesus. I realize probably all of you are Christians, but is there anyone here tonight that hasn't, that wants to accept Jesus as Savior? Become one with Jesus, one with God, one with us. Amen. Well, one other thing. Is there anyone here tonight that needs healing, or you want to stand in for someone who needs healing? Would you raise up, raise up your hand? There's a hand right back there. There's two. There's three. Would you guys, let's all stand for just a moment. I want to ask those three that raised their hand to come down here. I want to lay hands on you. Those who raised up their hand, would you just come right down here? I want to lay hands on you for just a moment. Agree with you in prayer. If it's you, you're healed. If it's a son or daughter or a friend, mother, dad, whoever it may be, I'm going to agree with you tonight, they're healed. Because if two shall agree on earth as touching anything, it shall be done for them of my Father who is in heaven. So would you come right down here? That's all right. Take your time. How about you go back faster than you came down here, okay? <laughs> I believe in the power of God. I believe in the power of God.
what's your prayer request? Ask about the knee that's going to have to have surgery. Okay. Okay. We've already talked. Well, how about tonight? Let's let Jesus be the surgeon, okay? Okay? There's nothing wrong with doctors, okay? Okay, Luke was a doctor. He traveled with a preacher. So I think God liked both of them, don't you? He never said, Paul, what are you doing with this jerk? He said, he's a physician. No. That guy wrote two books of the New Testament. On top of that, even God calls himself the great physician. So why don't we go to the great physician? All right, over your knee. The moment I touch you, you're going to sense that the power of God's going to come all over you. You're going to head right for that knee. You're going to change that, okay? Close your eyes. Get ready. Or you can already sense his presence right now. I can sense it right now, too. But the moment I touch you, Father, that knee is healed. Me? You foul demonic condition turned loose upon me. Father, thank you. This joint works perfectly. And the pain is gone. In Jesus' name. Is this for your eyes, sir? Yes. I'm going to say the same thing again. The power of God's going to hit your eyes. In the name of Jesus. Now just receive it. Oh, there's the power of God. Father, we thank you this done. Eyes see in Jesus' name. We receive our sight. It's a gift from God. The blind received their sight. We receive it. You accomplish it. That's it. In Jesus' name, it is done. Oh, thank you. When you open your eyes, expect to see. In the name of Jesus. Father, right now, you foul demonic condition that came on him through a stroke. We rebuke you in Jesus' name. And Father, thank you. He'll fulfill his life and do what you've asked him to do in the strength of God. We count it as done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Your pastor shared with me tonight that he's going to have a healing service coming up. I can't think of any better way to introduce people to Jesus than healing. Jesus healed and Jesus preached. It says after he preached for a long period of time, many believed on him. It says after he performed miracle signs and wonders and healing, it said, and many believed on him. The purpose of both is to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Kenneth Hagin that I work for used to say this. Healing is the dinner bell for the gospel. We ring it as loud as we can. And they come from everywhere to get healed. He says, you know what? You can't get healed without realizing that was impossible. I couldn't do it. Doctors couldn't do it. And they received Jesus as Savior. Praise God. Well, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. I'm going to teach them just the basics of faith tomorrow. We're going to talk about that. There's so much teaching on grace today. But you know what? The two work together for my grace are you saved through faith. We're going to talk about faith. And how that works in the body of Christ. Also how it works in you. So I'm excited. I could preach it right now. But I think I'll wait until tomorrow morning. Okay. <laughs> Pastor, go ahead. Good tonight.